So, uh, Roger Waldinger, if you want to begin the session, please. Uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, today we will open the critic uh, session, uh, and so we have uh, two critics, uh, and I've uh, reminded them that it's important to the critic session, not an audience patterns, so hopefully they just are wrong. It's ready for some tough uh, criticism and comments, so uh, we will um, we'll begin alphabetically, our first speaker will be Akulan Sarawana now. We're going to do now reverse alphabet. Okay. Yeah. Then Deep Gula Sakharan, who is Professor Gula and Tyler University. So, talk for about 20 minutes, followed by Akulan, roughly 20 minutes, a response from Hiroshi, and then we'll, we'll have questions. We'll have both. We'll start with two questions here, and then we will go to Mexico and uh, ping pong back and forth. Um, we will go to roughly 10 to 30. Of course, not all of you can take the entirety of the session, but but uh, depending on the that we are being joined uh, by participants uh, elsewhere, we, we will probably need more than the usual one and a half hour session. So, here. Okay, okay please. Okay. okay. I think that's the, that's the microphone thing that we'll say it looks like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, as I said, people are safe from Santa Fe University. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm glad to be speaking first. It would be difficult to find two harder acts to follow in immigration law than uh, Hiroshi Motobara and Michael Motobara. So Hiroshi is uh, who I consider to be the godfather of immigration law, not for Michael for the only sense, but in a more uh, kinder, gentler sense. I read his work because he makes the world of immigration law very clear. Uh, he has a remarkable ability to help me organize my own thoughts and to understand how a complex legal issue or legal area makes sense. Um, after you hear Hiroshi tell it, you always wonder why he thought it was so complicated in the first place. And here, with immigration outside the law, I'm able to do that really with a large scope here, the entirety of immigration law uh, and its thorniest subject, that of uh, what to do with unauthorized migrants. But as Professor Waldner just reminded us um, in his express directions to both him and me and to paraphrase, I suppose, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar, we come to critique Hiroshi, not to praise him. <laughs> so, uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to begin with a short overview uh, of, the, of the book and some of its key uh, points. I want to highlight how Hiroshi builds towards and delivers the ultimate argument of the book. Uh, the points I'm going to highlight here are necessarily a bridge, but they're the points that I think uh, both Mahila and I will return to uh, later on in some of the questions that uh, we're going to be asking Hiroshi. Mahila and will then follow with some of his own observations. And, and fighting for teeth of <laughs> So, thinking about the point of the book, I think ultimately what Hiroshi wants, us, wants to show us here is that there are strong historical, doctrinal, normative reasons for thinking of unauthorized migrants as, to, for, to borrow from the title of his prior work, as Americans in weight, and as such, our policy is that that, uh, that notion when it comes to migrants. He shows that the entirety of U.S. policy combines, you know, thinking about the combination of selective admission, selective enforcement, the need for a flexible workforce by U.S. employers, has essentially created a legitimate expectation and a de facto lawful avenue for those who are not the last migrants in the United States. This is all in service of, of arguing that uh, immigration law in practice looks a lot different than immigration law uh, as it's written in the congressional statute. In essence, he is arguing that despite the title of his book, Immigration Outside the Law, that unauthorized migrants should be thought of as immigrants inside the law. And so uh, perhaps a, a purposeful misdirection there with the title of his book. Um, 
So the, the real genius uh, and originality of the book is, is not in this general argument, but really in the way that Roshi provides some structure uh, to, to, to this debate uh, and offers us a way out of the ambivalence and disagreement that he says in the topic of unbacking administration. So and one thing I'll say off the bat, I'm actually going to be using those terms unauthorized uh, immigrant or undocumented immigrant as opposed to what you might call a of as an illegal alien or illegal immigrant. Uh, that itself, I'm not going to defend that choice for myself, but I will say that Hiroshi in chapter one of the book notes that that itself is a choice that we should be thinking about because it means something for how we think about the meaning of the significance of our So the book summary. So the introduction starts, and the book is framed by the case of Philo versus Doe. It's a 1982 Supreme Court case dealing with a 1975 Texas state law that allowed local school districts to either bar undocumented uh, students from attending the public schools or to charge them tuition, tuition which they could not pay. So essentially amounting to the barring of undocumented students um, from, from attending public school. The case is decided ostensibly on equal protection grounds uh, with a bare majority of the court holding that or deciding that Texas had no constitutionally from, uh, justifiable reason for excluding unauthorized minor children from school. From this case, Roshi teases out the three essential themes uh, that frame his book. One, that there's a contested significance of unlawful presence. Two, uh, asking what the relative role and significance of states and localities should be with regards to the regulation of unauthorized migrants. And three, the need and or desirability of integrating unauthorized uh, migrants into the general policy. Hiroshi spends the next three chapters of his book expanding on these three themes. Chapter one explains that the meaning of unlawful presence is itself contested, starting from, as I just mentioned, the difference in how we might view the term illegal alien versus undocumented or unauthorized immigrant to describe the American population. That is to say that he explains that some judicial, popular, and political discourse take the fact of unlawful presence as its starting and ending point, uh, and that becomes the trigger for all consequences that follow. For others, like the final majority, undocumented uh, unlawful presence is simply the starting point uh, from of the analysis. That by itself is inconclusive. Uh, and Hiroshi argues that 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 uh, that this is relatively uh, the the more defensible, more persuasive place to start. The key question here, perhaps, is whether this inconclusiveness uh, or the indeterminacy of unlawful presence is one of design. Hiroshi argues that history and legal development suggest that it is, in fact, one of design. Chapter two presents a framework for understanding state and local responses, assessing you know, what it is that courts are actually doing when they decide that a state or locality uh, can or cannot uh, enact a, a, a restrictive immigration law, or immigration or law that affects migrants. He provides historical context here, important historical context, noting that state and local actually the norm in the early parts, uh, or early uh, decades of the American Republic through the mid-1800s into the mid to late 1800s. But in the mid to late 1800s, the federal government uh, became the dominant force in the regulation of admission um, and entry. But to spite that, uh, that the state and local system is still playing a role but despite that Hiroshi notes that states still play a role in indirect enforcement, and Flyler itself is an example of such an indirect type of enforcement to attempt to regulate the government of schools. And he shows how, you know, obviously there have been other iterations, Prop 187 in California in the 1990s, and then of course the recent spate of state and local laws, most famously or infamously, depending on the point of view, Arizona SB 1070, Arizona Legal uh, Workers Act, and the several copycat legislation uh, that you can see in other states. Chapter three argues for the integration of undocumented persons, explaining that even unlawfully present persons, uh, at least many of them should be treated as Americans in waiting. Uh, here, starting from the flyer, uh, suggestion that the court was afraid of the, quote, specter of a permanent past uh, that would be created if these school children were kept out of the public school. The challenge here for Hiroshi, for Hiroshi is to explain why the logic of Flyler uh, in the context of children should and can be extended to also uh, Indian adults. Interestingly, and this is the point I'll come back to, Hiroshi spends significant time in this chapter defending the idea of national borders. 
He knows that there is somewhat of an inherent tension in his argument. That is to say that if we're, our, if we're going to make an argument for, for see, integration, it's essentially an argument for uh, some form of equality as to unauthorized migrants, uh, that that has to occur within, uh, he argues, within some sort of a bounded sphere. And Hiroshi defends the notion that the bounded sphere in which we're going to act, act for uh, this flourishing equality will be the borders of the nation state. But as Hiroshi himself acknowledges, this creates an inherent tension because the very idea of reinforcing the, the significance of the nation state order means that you've created some form of inherent inequality, at least uh, between those who are outside the nation state and those who are within the nation. But as I said, Hiroshi doesn't want to give up on the idea of national border instead of defending them as creating the boundless society within which equality is blurred. He suggests that there are some hard requirements or some hard some requirements that should that need to be fulfilled in order to make this aspiration a reality that is involved in flourishing within these nation state borders. Uh, but again, he has to note that the long history of racial exclusion and discrimination in the US, both in immigration policy and without it, uh, undermine some of the requirements that he feel need to be met uh, in order for the quality of flourish within these nation the central challenge here, uh, is, again, is to explain why adults, although having crossed unlawfully the nation state border, um, should are nevertheless entitled to be treated as, as American in waiting, or nevertheless entitled to uh, integrate into uh, American society. The strongest version of this defense that Hiroshi offers is that US policy is, in fact, an invitation to this group uh, to come in, and this provides the normative impulse that helps Hiroshi transcend Flyway's uh, factual constriction to the context of children. Having discussed these three themes separately, four, five, and six, then take up the integration of these three uh, themes. Chapter four looks at the, the, the interaction between chapters one and two, that is the meaning of unlawful presence uh, and who gets to decide as between the federal government and states and localities. I know that this is not uh, a purely legal audience, so I won't delve into the details of Hiroshi's doctrinal defense here. Uh, but he suggests here that, you know, Kleider was, or Kleider was ostensibly in the case, but as he notes, most cases in this area are decided on preemption grounds. For those of you unfamiliar, preemption is uh, the doctrinal area in which was, the courts are attempting to assess the relationship between a state law and federal power, the exercise of, of federal authority. <coughs> These are arguably two separate things, right? You actually dealing with individual rights or the rights of, uh, of, of these people arguing that they, they don't deserve to be classified in a particular way. Preemption, on the other hand, deciding the structural power relationship between the federal government uh, and sub-federal entities. Here again, in explaining some of the, the or in defending some of the results of the preemption cases in the Supreme Court of the Federal Court, Hiroshi relies on the fundamental premise that federal immigration in enforcement in practice is different than federal immigration law and um, statutes, and it's this practice that must be legitimately understood as part and parcel of federal immigration law. Robust preemption, that is robust uh, application of the idea that only the federal government should be in the business of enforcing immigration law, leads to, um, as Hiroshi argues, less discrimination, not necessarily because federal actors are less discriminatory than state or local actors, but because we've shrunk the universe of those actors who are engaged in federal immigration enforcement. Chapter five, in some ways, is the mirror of chapter four. It looks to uh, an asymmetry in the state and local, um, in the state and local responses. That is to say, some state and local responses are not restricted, but are integrated. And here, it's the relationship between the meaning of unlawful presence and integration, or in other words, chapters two and three. State and local action, as I just heard, is by period. Uh, and we have in-state tuition laws, uh, professional licensing laws in California, uh, in recent case out of California Supreme Court, allowing an uh, undocumented applicant to the California bar to receive his uh, professional license and, and legislation that was just signed and cleared the way for the more types of professional licensing, and other types of resistance to federal enforcement efforts, also municipal ID laws in several cities and counties uh, that allow anyone, regardless of immigration status, to have uh, such an ID. 
Hiroshi defends this asymmetry. He says, essentially, conceptually, it's fine to have uh, preemption that, that invalidates the restrictive laws with regard to not that migrant, but to allow uh, for these integrative laws with regard to the So in truth, um, he shows that these integrationist laws offer a sense of belonging and provide rights and membership within the local jurisdiction. Uh, one of the more interesting things here is he, he talks about the doctrinal development in the employment law context, noting that in uh, in several cases, there have, uh, the courts have allowed undocumented workers to assert employment-based claims despite their unlawful um, presence. Chapter six looks at the relationship between chapters one and three, that is the meaning of unlawful presence and integration. And specifically here, Hiroshi takes on a defense the necessity of some form of the legalization policy as part of broader immigration reform. He defends the DREAM Act proposals, and I want to be clear here, there's been no DREAM Act that's ever been passed. This is separate from DACA, right, the Deferred Action for Child Arrivals Program, an administrative program which may be to the benefit of that same group but does not provide lawful status in the way that the DREAM Act uh, legislative proposal would. He notes that the DREAM Act uh, and proposals have similar conceptual practical roots to the 14th Amendment's birthright citizenship clause, that is the clause that, that confers citizenship by birth on U.S. territory. Again here, though, in defending both of these, the Hiroshi has to essentially extrapolate from children and birth to adults, right? That is the concept that, that most, or most of the significant portion of the unauthorized population are adult, adults who may have uh, entered without inspection in the course of their life. Uh, the defense of legalization program um, deals with institutionalizing essentially this acquiescence and to the cyclical uh, uh, workforce that has been uh, entering the United States and authorized. He shows, and I think this is a key part of the book, he shows that legalization, that the concept is not new. Right? That conceptually, these types of legalization programs have been, have already, are already a part of US immigration law history and even current policy for individuals and small groups uh, using a variety of methods that are already within uh, immigration law, and therefore a mass legalization program, although it's obviously applied to a great number of people, conceptually it's not different than uh, programs that are in immigration law. Chapter then, uh, seven then concludes with what might, we might think of as the logical corollary to the, the legalization chapter, that is uh, a chapter that questions whether temporary workers or program temporary workers um, might help us out of this quantity of unauthorized migration. And he attempts to look at temporary worker programs through four potential analytic lenses. That is, what's the relationship between temporary workers and unauthorized workers? What's the economic impact of a temporary worker program? How, how do temporary workers affect international economic development? And in turn, how does international economic development then have a feedback loop that would affect unauthorized migration? And then finally, how would the temporary worker program work with the integration uh, of unauthorized workers or the worker class that we see here, uh, noting that it very well might be corrosive in quality norms within the, the receiving society if temporary workers uh, are brought in but are not given the power to integrate and benefit. You know, he gives some suggestions on what this temporary program might look like. Um, he notes that there is a tendency with these suggestions that he offers for a temporary program to essentially become permanent or to look more like permanent migration, another inherent tension uh, in the choices that he offers. Because it, uh, as we, I think as we can all have an intuition of a permanent program it is, a, is one that is more politically thought and more politically difficult. Right? But in, as, in, in essence, Hiroshi here argues that any temporary worker program would have to be designed with incentives and choices that provide options for those temporary workers uh, to eventually become members of American society, if that is something that is desired. So there's a lot more to say about this book. It's even more nuanced. Uh, it's not obviously more nuanced uh, than, than what I've presented. But I think uh, I've been faithful to what Crush has argued about what Crush can tell me uh, in what ways I've heard in, in, in presenting the argument. So let me start with two broad questions before I turn it over to Mike. One, um, I, I think that I found that uh, the, the starting point of the to be an odd starting point. I know Crush has probably heard of this critique before, and so perhaps what I'm asking to do is to, to, to defend it further. 
Um, but the case has serious limitations. Its reasoning is negative. It's ultimately decided on equal protection grounds, but it's not decided like any other equal protection case that uh, you're likely to see uh, after the trial of the society. In the sense, it's somewhat of a negative come on with reasoning. Um, justice is sort of essentially saying this sort of field right, and we're going to dress it up in equal protection clothing. Another limitation is Plyler is in the education context. And I think one can rightly read Plyler to really just be about the fundamental importance of education. Think about it, you know, it cites Brown versus Board of Education, and education, obviously, an education based time. It follows San Antonio versus Rodriguez, another case that deals with the importance of education. Uh, there having to do with whether poor school districts have a claim underneath the protection clause for a different type of funding system. But the justices mainly agree in that case that education is very important, that it's very well much a fundamental level uh, that we need to think about uh, in our legal career. There are laws in, in, in every state that require schooling for the school-aged children that are at issue in Florida. It's written into some state, it's written into many state constitutions, the importance of education, and that education is a fundamental right. It's a default understanding of what minors in this country do. Uh, and in order to get out from that understanding, most people need to have some sort of First Amendment religious liberty claim, a free exercise claim, not to attend all uh, types of public school. So in this sense, the pilot, starting with Plyler seems to be a tough place to start because of the context of the, the way that it's limited. It also provides easy fodder for opponents. As George himself knows, since Plyler, there have been several attacks on the case, none of which have made it to the Supreme Court. But I think most advocates in immigration law would be uh, very pleased that none of them have made it to the Supreme Court because it is speculative at best and maybe highly likely at worst that Plyler might would be overruled if actually presented to the Supreme Court. It's an easy case to distinguish and dismiss. Um, and, and I think the final limitation, obviously the one that I've spoken about a couple times, it forces the to extrapolate from children to um, to adults, it is true that one can, can discern the three themes that Hiroshi talks about from Tyler, but it's equally true that one can discern those three themes generally thinking about immigration law. These are not themes that are particular to Tyler, they don't need Tyler for them, and its limitations might suggest that Hiroshi may have made a misstep in relying so heavily on Tyler to report. One might simply say that these are three themes that, that pervade immigration law. One might also say maybe a better starting point were the employment cases. This deals with the population that Hiroshi was, uh, was intending to talk about uh, uh, more generally, and the adult worker population. It gets to the concern of, uh, the core of the concern with unauthorized migrants, that is the concern with work and employment. And those cases deal, as Hiroshi himself points out, with the concept of comparative fault. That yes, there is some, perhaps there is some fault with the unlawful presence, but the fault of the employer uh, may be greater. And therefore, unlawful presence isn't the start and be all and end all of their existence, but we have to think about other, uh, other types of concerns that might apply. That's my first general point. The second point is to return to the concept of the nation state, nation state border that Hiroshi defends. And I, I want to hear and ask Hiroshi how committed he is to the, main, the notion of nation state borders and defending it. He doesn't explicitly ever say that he's a defender of open borders in the book, but every other concept he argues for, including the need for foreign development, suggests that he really is arguing for some form of open borders, but doesn't want to say it because it's politically not a palatable thing to say. The conditions that he proposes that need to be met internally, uh, domestically, within the bounded nation state are nice. They're aspirational. But they're goals that the US has never reached, and I would argue never likely to reach, at least not in the near future. It's also somewhat interesting to think about the endorsement of the integration schemes at the state and local level as against Hiroshi's uh, argument that the nation state is the, the bounded society in which quality has occurred. It seems difficult then to, to defend ID cards and driver's licenses, which provide a form of membership within a local <coughs> Or perhaps even more difficult, and Hiroshi doesn't address this in the book because I think this came after his book, but we might also think about, for example, the needs of a state citizenship bill that was proposed in New York earlier 
this summer, right, which many innovation advocates, uh, friends of both of those and, and mine and Iowans, argued uh, for and brought to me the, the, uh, the New York State Legislature. I'm curious how, how we should think about those, because that would create perhaps a, well, at least a concern that goes, you know, with a thousand petty fortresses that also one. So I will stop there uh, and turn it over to you. Thank you. I am Akhil and our lot of them, and thank you, Professor Alka and the Center of the Whole for inviting as well. Uh, my uh, day job is I'm a litigator for the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, doing immigrants' rights work. So I'm the, uh, I work out of Los Angeles for both the Southern California ACLU and the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project. And for people who may not know what the ACLU is, it's like a human rights organization that works in a variety of different areas. Um, but as I said, my focus is on, uh, on the rights of immigrants. And uh, I was also instructed uh, very uh, strictly uh, to, for this not to be a, a phrasing, but in fact a critical uh, reading of, of, of Dr. Motowara's book. Uh, and I will do that, but I'll say a few things at the outset. The first is it's a fabulous book. And if, uh, if you want to have an understanding of a lot of contemporary debates in immigration law, that are actually debates that immigrant rights activists uh, and litigators are working on now, and this is about you know, two thirds of them or something like that, are, are, covered, in, are covered in the book. So it's a remarkable achievement for that uh, uh, itself. Um, the other thing is, the other thing I would say is that I, I've read Hiroshi's work really since I was in law school. Um, and I've, I've read it, you know, articles and books for a long time. I thought I'm a huge fan. Um, but but I've, I've read them really for three different things, and that's what I sort of want to center my, my remarks around. Um, the, the first thing is, it's just for a historical understanding of the immigration law. It is so important to be engage in uh, discourse, whether it be activism, litigation, public education about immigration, to understand what what things have been like. And people say it's never happened before like this. You've never, for example, had a system where there were, say, no immigration quotas. You know, and when uh, Dr. Gillespie says it's sort of like an argument for open borders, well, like, that's so crazy. Can you imagine that we wouldn't have a quota for deciding how many people can come and stay in Mexico, in the United States? But one of the things you will find in the book is that we didn't have one before 1965, uh, for for really ever before before that time. Uh, I also have often read. Hiroshi's books and articles for legal arguments in support of litigation. As I said, that's sort of my day job. Uh, and there have often been gems in there. Um, and that's that's definitely one of the things I want to come to in this book as well. There are some uh, very good litigation arguments uh, or ideas, uh, sort of gems, uh, seeds, you can say, um, for ideas in this book also. Um, but uh, there are also reasons why other of the arguments wouldn't necessarily fare so well um, for use in court. Um, and then the other thing, of course, that I read them, that I think everyone, most people read um, before, is for the kind of broader normative uh, policy prescriptions, things like that that are there. I thought I can talk about those as well. Um, last thing I'll say by way of uh, introduction is that although I am, uh, I do work for the ACLU, I'm, I'm doing this uh, with a hat off. I mean, this is my own kind of observer and thinker. And many of the things that I'm saying are actually not things that the ACLU has positioned on one way or the other. So just briefly about the history, um, this book is certainly as good as all the other you know, books and articles and everything. It comes a rich account of all kinds of interesting history. Um, one which has no connection to anything else, but it's so good and interesting that I have to just tell you right now. Uh, there's a description of this Chinese confession program. Uh, it's on page 194 of the book. And then there's some interesting citations about it in the footnotes. And it's a historical moment today of the way the immigration law is being used as part of the national security state, what, what, how it's used and employed in different ways against a lot of the Muslim communities in the United States. You've got to read this account of this program that existed you know, back now, what was it, uh, 50 years ago or something. Um, and so that, that's just one thing I would just throw out uh, sort of interest. Um, the second thing I would say, which I alluded to earlier, <laughs> the book makes clear there's no quotas for the Western Hemisphere prior to 1965. I think that's a really important uh, uh, historical fact that's relevant to the book. 
I think one could make the argument, as Professor Gosekram already did, um, that, that for me, many of the arguments in the book are actually better arguments, not necessarily for an open border, but for a world without quotas, or at least without quotas for the countries that are sending lots and lots of people here. Um, and as I'll explain, you know, a lot of what I want to say here is I think many of the other arguments that uh, Hiroshi advances for the claims in the book are not as strong as what would be a sort of simpler and more elegant claim, but I recognize a politically more difficult one, which is just that it is fundamentally unequal to treat somebody different based on the place of their birth, because the place that they are born is not something that they have any responsibility for or any control over, and therefore to deny them economic opportunities on that basis requires a very, very strong justification, um, and one that, that I think is much uh, harder to come by than justifications against the other things that he is proposing here. So I think that historical point is relevant for that. The third thing I'll say um, by way of history, which I think is here um, in the book here and there, but which I think uh, could be emphasized much more, right? there is a massive, massive increase in the number of deportations from the United States conducted by the federal government starting in 2006. Uh, right? and, and it's not only targeted against particularly disfavorable groups, like say uh, people with criminal convictions, although that certainly there are there's more enforcement against them as well. But during the first, two, uh, excuse me, the last two years of the George W. Bush administration, we saw massive worksite raids. Right? We saw them here in Los Angeles uh, as well. Huge raid of Van eyes in, in uh, uh, 2006. And and what what we had there was the administration going out and arresting people who were working in this country, thousands of them by the end of the whole program. Right? And, and from my perspective, the putting people on notice that what the administration wanted to do was arrest and detain and deport thousands of people because they were working in this country and for no other reason. And now since the Obama administration has been a shift to some degree, massive worksite raids don't happen in the way they happened during that era. But the Obama administration does what's called I-9 enforcement, I-9 audits. And they go to companies and will take all of the, you know, ask for or subpoena as necessary, all of the employment records from that company. And then we'll come back to the employer and say, uh, we found, whatever it is, 30%, 70%, whatever, of these people, the document that they gave you to authorize their employment does not show up in our records. You better do something about it. And of course, that has been illegal. The employment of people who are not authorized to work has been a crime since 1986 under IRCA, um, and it's illegal Immigration Reform and Control Act. Um, and and that, that law is on the books, and it is being enforced by the Obama administration. So uh, that historical note I, I wanted to make because it's relevant to something that we say later. And then the last one I'll say, and also relevant to what we say later, the deportation of people on the basis of criminal conviction uh, is also, it has existed for a long period of time, but the scope of the conviction that rendered you deportable, that, that which ones rendered you deportable, is dramatically expanded uh, between 1988 and 1996. So you, know, you have a time in 1988 when murder, rape, and arms trafficking, I think, are the only convictions for which one is deportable at all. And then in the space of eight years, you end up in a world in 1996 where two petty thefts is deportable. And any controlled substance offense other than possession of less than 30 grams of marijuana is deportable. And this is a fundamental shift. And it does get enforced. It takes time for it to ramp up. There is massive enforcement against people with minor criminal convictions. People are deported every day for minor criminal convictions. That is on the law, on the books from 1996 on. So where is, you know, how is it sort of you know, relevant to some, some ideas, uh, criticism, critical ideas of the book? You know, well, well, one, which uh, Professor Gosekram already uh, uh, you know, talked about, so I'll just talk about it briefly, but just say, you know, sort of, I agree you know, with what he has to say, and I think it's particularly agree with respect to people who do litigation on the question of the relevance of why would we go. You know, here, uh, you have a case which, I won't repeat everything he said, but you know, a lot of people think that that is not a case that uh, you know, it's, it's necessarily a, a, a sound legal footing. And so to make an argument, certainly in the uh, litigation or even the sort of legal world for 
uh, anything uh, based on other than other than education for uh, undocumented children, uh, public school education, primary school, and secondary school education for uh, on, on the basis of filer is not a, not a, a wise a wise choice. Uh, now, of course, this is fundamentally unfair to Hiroshi in the sense that he did not write this book to kind of give us arguments to put yeah. in our briefs, right? Um, but you do find, even in this book, other arguments which are the basis of challenges to various kinds of laws. I, the, the whole, the very beginning on, um, of the book on the question of what does it mean to be illegal, right? yeah, you've seen that bumper sticker, right? Like, what part of illegal don't you understand? Right, but, but the whole first, you know, that, that opening of the book is, is really just a complete deconstruction of that idea. Does that mean you can't get married? Does it mean that you can't go buy gas at the gas station? You know, like, what does it mean to really say that the person is illegal? When, of course, there are all kinds of legal, legally bound, legally structured transactions and relationships that they can be in and get into play. Um, that was a central piece of the arguments that the ACLU made, not me myself, but that um, other attorneys working with the ACLU made in Alabama, in the Alabama litigation, you know, all of South Carolina, all of the uh, sort of harshest and the measures. So I think there are things here, uh, fantastic, but, that, but to me, the reliance on filer as a central point is, is not uh, one of them. Um, the other one, which I guess I would focus on a lot, there's a couple others, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you another one for, 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 for now. Um, Hiroshi spent a lot of time making an argument that I would call, characterized as a reliance argument in favor of legalization. And when I say reliance, reliance is a very robust concept in immigration law that appears again and again. The basic idea is um, if, if, the, if the government kind of holds out something to you and you then rely on it, uh, then it's not fair for them to take it away, and just in its, most, in its most simple basis. And Hiroshi's argument sort of coming out of that is something like um, the economy invites immigrants because the labor force requirements are such that uh, there's a, a magnet for it for them. Uh, lots of those people who come here eventually are uh, able to legalize. And here's another fascinating uh, statistic in the book. Something like 30% of green card holders uh, presently, right? It's a snapshot number, right? Got their green card after having either unlawfully entered across the border unlawfully or overstayed their visas. So the, the, the law allows you many different ways, even if you come here unlawfully or, or stay unlawfully, to adjust. And then, of course, we have the mass legalizations that come from time to time, 1986 uh, being the, the famous one, the, the IRCA, the so-called amnesty. Um, but then also lots of other programs that do the same thing. And so Hiroshi's argument essentially is uh, when you have all these things going on in the law, people can rely on that uh, in order to come here. And I think that's a very, very difficult argument. Now, I think it's a very, very difficult argument legally. It was an extremely difficult argument legally because the Supreme Court and lower courts have consistently rejected reliance-based arguments uh, brought on behalf of undocumented people. And they distinguish between those and reliance arguments brought on behalf of people who do have lawful status. And those have worked done remarkably well, um, including in, in 2001, in this case called Supreme Court case called INSB St. Peter, where they said a person who was a lawful resident and the government had changed the immigration rules that applied to that person's deportation case. And the court said, OK, you can do it for people after uh, who are convicted um, after the law, but you can't do it for people before, because they have a reliance interest in the law as it exists as, at the time. There's a recent uh, Supreme Court case that, it, again, in a couple actually that reaffirmed that. On the other hand, for undocumented people, there's also a Supreme Court case involving similar arguments, and they lose eight to one. Right? And Hiroshi's not, not hiding the ball. He says, I think the, the one is correct. <laughs> but but, I, but I, I think that's you know, it's a very hard argument. I, I also think it's very hard as a policy argument uh, after 2006. You know, I mentioned to you earlier, right? you have this massive, massive increase in the number of deportations starting in 2006. So in fact, if you put it in historical terms, from the beginning of deportation law, of federal deportation in 1892 until, I think, 1996, about 2 million people get deported. And then from 2000, sorry, from 2008, the start of the Obama administration until just earlier this year, in those six years, 2 million people get deported again at the same amount of time. I see a massive increase. 
So doesn't that seriously undercut, for me it does, it seriously undercuts the argument um, that people can have a reliance interest in being here when the government has, has some massive, massive enforcement against this group of people since that time. Um, I think there are better arguments, uh, as I said, um, and that's a real sacred and kind of uh, alluded to, but to me that's, that's not really one of them. Another thing which I think is a, a, a very serious difficulty is the role of discretion. This is a theme that recurs throughout the book. Um, and for me, um, I really think there's a, there's a tension in, in the arguments that Hiroshi's making. Federal discretion is good. In fact, it's necessary to give sort of a moral dimension and take off some of the, uh, sort of ameliorate some of the harshness of the immigration law. Right? But it also has to be periodically tempered with like categorical rules that are not some case by case discretion, but that are categorical, um, because otherwise you'd have sort of individual inequality between different groups. Right? Except on the other hand, immigration judges should have more discretionary authority, uh, like they did prior to 1996, because that was sort of fair and gave more fairness on an individualized basis, right? These are all things that look. But states shouldn't have discretion. They shouldn't have discretion to kind of enforce immigration law. They should essentially be out of it entirely. And in a future kind of post-legalization world, uh, really, as I, as I read the book, there would be very little need for discretionary enforcement decisions at all, because the, the number of people allowed to come would basically match the workforce, more or less. Uh, and, and for me, that, you know, sort of, that's like five different positions on discretion, depending on like, who it is, and who the actor is, and what the context is. And I don't see any kind of unifying theme here. For me, it seems clear um, you would ideally live in a world where the immigration law was quite certain uh, there would be very, very little discretion, much less. Uh, but people who had a reasonable basis to be here should be allowed to be here. And people who didn't, whatever your normative theory is for didn't, they should be not here, and that's a decision that should happen very quickly. Whether that should be lots of people, or if you believe, like me personally, like very few people who would, who would fit into that category. So I think there's inconsistency there. The last thing I'll say on that subject um, of, of sort of problems I have with certain rationales that are in the book concerns the argument for uh, really from legalization derived from birthright citizenship. When I mean, Hiroshi uh, tries to make the argument that birthright citizenship, that either if you are born in this country, then you are a citizen from the 14th Amendment, uh, from the time of the, the Civil War, that is the rule, fundamental. It doesn't matter who your parents are, how they got here, what the story is. You are born here, unless you are uh, the child of an ambassador or born in the like one in the two or exception. Uh, you, everybody born in the territory of the U.S. It goes from there to the DREAM Act, the idea that children who were brought here by their parents at a young age and didn't make the choice to come here uh, should not should not be thereby, such that this is really the only country they have ever known, um, should not be denied uh, the ability to stay here. And from there, to legalization even of uh, the parents of those children, and not just those people, but other people also, on sort of a pragmatic rationale, um, or I don't know, actually I, I, I'd be curious, if, um, I can also get a question in for you, it's like, what is what is the argument for how you get um, you know from from one from one to the last? For me, there are big leaps along the way. You know, the, the, the children didn't make the choice to come here; they were brought here by their parents. Even if people are brought here by violence or uh, an economic uh, hardship, uh, which, which certainly to me is a valid rationale for them being able to stay here, it's still a choice, and it's fundamentally different. From children who are not choosing at all and don't even really know what's going on, they get into the car with their parents uh, or the bus or whatever it is. And I think there's also a big leap from the birthright to the, to the Dream Act, um, because the, the, for me, the primary rationale of birthright citizenship is based on the territorial distinction and the idea that people who are within this territory are to be treated as fundamentally part of the people who are here, um, as opposed to other people who are coming here um, and they're not born here. And I guess that gets me to the very last thing I, I, I want to say. Uh, again, this is something that Professor Bill Taker had sort of foreshadowed. To me, all of the arguments in the book uh, that I like, and I think are strong arguments, are really arguments for a more focused world. And, and the arguments that I think are, are weaker are the arguments for trying to draw distinctions between certain groups of people who are here to get to stay versus other groups of people who do not. The, the counterclaim, the defensive orders in chapter three of the book, to me is really a defense of citizenship. It's a defense of the idea that there's some group of people who are within a particular uh, um, 
uh, community, and for that reason should have certain special rights, like the right to choose their leaders and certain other rights. But those, to me, are arguments for having citizens in a world where there are no quotas. And you could have quite a high, a high bar for how you go from being allowed to just be here and work here to actually being a citizen here and therefore having um, additional rights. And I don't see any argument in the book, actually, at all, uh, which is really an argument against quotas. Instead, you have a proposal for guest workers, uh, but that proposal at the end, right, the, the temporary workers proposal, it, it has to allow for those people to come to as much as the labor market demands. They have to be able to renew. Um, I gather, I don't get the, the feel, but I gather the renewal would happen as long as there's a job available, right? Uh, it also requires um, uh, those people to ultimately be able to adjust their status to become lawful residents and then have a path to citizenship for equality grounds. Uh, it also, the legalization part, would legalize everybody who would be authorized in the guest worker program to stay here. And to me, I guess I just feel as though there's a lot of different kinds of very difficult arguments that are made to justify this when there really is one simple one staring you uh, in the face. That if there's a job here for you, then you should be able to come and do it. Uh, and, and that, to me, is really what the book, uh, the, the argument that I, the, the, the policy prescription and ultimate argument that I that I draw from the book, which to me is a, a stronger than the, than the argument that's right there. So I'll, I'll stop there, um, but I look forward to the discussion. Uh, and it really is, as I said, a fabulous book. I really strongly recommend you all have to look at it. I worked on this book in my spare time for eight years, um, and so it's hard for me to believe that it actually has a cover of um, and it's out. Um, I'm going to try to limit myself to 10 minutes here, because I want to hear what people would have to say. Um, but a lot's been raised, and I would like to try to at least um, suggest how I would respond, or at least start to respond to all of them, because there's such great, there's such great questions that you could write a book about for each of these points. Starting with Plyler, this is an interesting thing. Um, I mean, I have to, so I, part of what I'm going to say in these 10 minutes is, is also confessional. In other words, I will sort of partly play the part of my own critic and sort of say, yeah, you're right. I really shouldn't have done that. <laughs> uh, because I think the choice to start with Plyler is one that deserves some attention. And I think that one of the reasons, you know, um, one of the reasons that people, people are skeptical about the choice to start with Plyler is that Plyler is, I think, a very fragile legal precedent. But that, to me, makes it actually um, a more interesting case, because in writing this book, it's about law. I suppose it's what I know about. But it's not really meant to be a, a, a book for lawyers. Um, it's really not writing to the law audience, per se. Um, and I think the reason that Plyler, I think the very reason that Plyler is fragile as, um, as legal doctrine makes it more interesting and more provocative as policy. I think it represents a way of thinking. I mean, it's a way of thinking that's deeply contested. But I think that it does raise the three issues. Um, my colleague Noah Zach suggested when he read an earlier draft of part of this, that why don't you start the book? This is a deep suggestion. Why don't you start the book with employment cases? Why don't you start with hot and plastic? Uh, and I really thought about that. Um, and I think that, that nothing like Tyler, which if you get away from the fact that it's fragile, I think it does raise the issues that have dominated a state local authority, the integration of unauthorized migrants, and what it means to be in the country illegally. It raises it, it also raises at the ideal historical moment, which is the period in the 1970s when 
that when you look at a car generation, how you deal with unauthorized migration. Um, so it's it's it, it, so it is. It, that's one thing. The other thing I'll say about starting pilot is it's just it's just a start. It's just a framing. It's not so much a defense of the majority of pilot as extrapolating what the logical consequences of the majority are. And that gets me to the second point, um, which is the the difference between um, children and adults. And I think that is a very challenging thing, but in a way it's almost as if I'm challenging the reader, I guess, to, or the critics, to, to try to, to work with through me uh, what exactly the court is saying in Plyler. And Plyler is a case about children, but Plyler is, says many things that I think are very much applicable to adults. And this is the whole first chapter, I mean, really the first chapter might have been called, uh, as you suggest, Dr. Lyler, might have been called the parts of the legal that I really don't understand. <laughs> and, and, and some of this has to do with the fact that I think that if the children are came here, um, there's a certain innocence, of course. But the, the response to the innocence point is um, that if we, if we really, t if you really don't, uh, if you're really going to be strictly uh, enforcement minded, I think what you would do is you would say that well, they may be innocent, but it's an unfortunate consequence of enforcement policy that we visit the consequences of, children, of parents' actions on their children. We do it all the time. Why don't we do it in Plyler? So I think there's more going on in Plyler than just the focus on children. I think as a doctrinal matter, Justice Powell cast the fifth vote in favor of the majority, in favor of allowing the kids to go to school because he was concerned about, about what it would mean for common law to write a broader decision. But I think more deeply, if you look at this as a political decision and what it says about fault lines in the American public that have continued to this day, it's, um, I think that's what's going on. And I think that also is the reason why, sure, it's contested whether it applies to children or applies to adults. But, if you, but, but I think that I'm trying to make the case that we're counting the history of immigration law, particularly in the 20th century and in the second half of the 20th century, I think that at least works, if not to convince, at least the frame of the debate um, at the level I want to frame it, which is the policy debate. So it's, it's clearly, uh, and, and, and honestly, here's, here's another thing which makes you realize, you know, one of the great things about hearing like what the book was about <laughs> was because, oh, okay, I guess I, guess I did say that. <laughs> uh, you know, what happens is you work on these things and you're kind of doing it, you know, from 11.30 to one in the morning and that kind of thing. You kind of, every day it's like something you're trying to do and all of a sudden you kind of, it's only, it's only I, can't, I can't tell you how much I've learned about what I was trying to say in this book after it came out. <laughs> Um, and not because I wasn't aware of it, but just because, oh yeah, that is what the point is. Um, so, um, but here's, one of the things I, I, I realized is, and this gets back to the, now the reliance thing, okay? I think the big, this is okay, um, the, the, the big thing about the reliance, I think that the, uh, I think it is true that immigration law takes a turn in, 19, in the mid-2000s that makes it harder to make the reliance argument in the same way that one might have made it in the 80s and 90s when the government really had a much stronger policy or more more pronounced and discernible policy of looking the other way. I think it's true. Um, but I still think that, 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 that a lot of the enforcement, as, as harsh as it is, as much as hardship as it is it's on people, really is not, um, it still remains a, a policy of very selective enforcement and very selective selective discussion. And one thing that's in the book that we haven't really talked about, but that I really want to name because I think it is central to the book, and that is uh, the racial piece of this. I think much of my recounting the history is a story of the United States um, treating Latin America in a certain way, particularly when I was back. And I think that, um, so I think that continues partly through the deportations, but also in a system that says, even though we deported 4,000, uh, 100,000 people a year, that we have a system that, that still operate, that allows the economy to operate um, through a disposable workforce. One that doesn't necessarily work more cheaply, but works in a situation where it's easier to have that workforce contract or expand. And I think that continues. And so the reliance argument, I think, is not as dramatically strong as it was, but I still think it's one of the to the system. And I think race is a piece of this. Uh, Okay, um, that brings me to um, the 14th Amendment legalization. That's a really interesting. Um, the 14th Amendment legalization, the reason I think about this, I, I realize this is one of the things you realize about what you're thinking um, more deeply when you hear it sort of rendered back to you and critique is, is that um, I think of the 14th Amendment largely driven not territorially, but 
But really it says that if we, the five star review, what if we didn't have a 14th Amendment? What if we had people as they do in many other countries in the world who are, who are second, third, fourth, fifth generation foreigners? I think that'd be really deeply problematic. And I think that the real reason we have the 14th Amendment, although it's the fine territory, the real reason we have it is because there are certain feelings that we have, views we have about what it means to belong, and much of that is living in a society and that that should be recognized. If you look at that way, the 14th Amendment is just like the Blue Act, and just like the legalization. I think this, the pressures for legalization, for example, in this country would be much stronger if we didn't have the 14th Amendment. Because at least with the 14th Amendment, we can say that even if we don't legalize people, at least they kids who exist. So I think that they're... Um, so that's, that's what I have to say about working out the legalization, and that brings me to the point um, that, that both of you made about um, open borders and citizenship. There, there are two parts of that. Uh, I think the reason that chapter three is not an argument for, um, it's an argument for, uh, it, it doesn't become an argument about citizenship, it's, because maybe I don't see citizenship that way. I mean, the idea that we would have rules for a inner circle of citizens among the many people that we live here. I guess that's not, not, not consistent with what I think about citizenship. Um, but the larger problem, is, and that, I just have two other things to say about this. This is so much, this is so, uh, you know, this is so rich that they're and, and, and challenging, provocative, everything you've said. Um, is this book really an argument for open borders? Um, and then, and am I, is that what I really think? And why am I not saying that? Is it just because I don't want to say it? Because I think it's, I just, you know, different people who read the book. I mean, um, let me say two things on that. Uh, one is that I think the logical, if you add up all, I think I hear quite right, the deepest quite right, but if you add up all the little things I say, it is allowing the economy to drive a lot of who we let into the country. I think the breakdown that we have right now is that we have, um, we have a policy that wants to close the border, but at the time that it doesn't, and we keep them in. A lot of people are caught up in that gap. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, eliminate that exploited population, by, um, and that means having more lawful admissions. Um, but as I think points out, I don't, know, I don't know if that's an argument for open borders. It's really an argument for kind of a presumption. So, I think it operationalizes this way, that um, even if it's not open borders, at least is an argument more generally for having more people come who uh, the economy seems to want to, uh, to work. Um, and and it's, it's maybe it's a notion of what is the second best here. I mean, my sense of the second best here is that it would be better to have more people um, come to the country. Right now, there's no, there's very little lawful avenue for people to come to this country if they don't have a college degree, um, if they people who want to come to work. And, and so I, I'm not, I recognize that the open, that the cordless system is not, um, it may just be politically unfeasible, but I'd like, to, I'd like to think about that not in terms of a proposal for uh, open borders or, or a quotaless system, and, and, and say that Congress or whoever reads this book, take it or leave it. I'd like to I set it up differently. And set it up differently means here are some things you can think about doing. Each of them will be an improvement. If you do them all, it might end up being not a quota system, but at least we can think about this incrementally instead of a, kind of a take it or leave it. I'm trying to get away from take it or leave it, which is probably why I don't think about this in terms of uh, open borders. Um, last thing, what you said about each of these things, but the last thing follows from, from what I just said about the tension between making this a book arguing for non-quotas for, uh, versus something that's a little bit more modest. I think that when you write a book like, maybe, maybe everyone who writes anything thinks about this, that I would think a lot of immigration policy in the real world as an exercise in trying to identify second, third, fourth facets. In other words, maybe in an ideal world, you know, there would be no, there would be no inequality across borders. Um, there'd be prosperity everywhere. Um, and so the question for me is, how do you get to certain things? And so what, the reason, I'm, I'm very deeply skeptical in many ways of temporary workers, but I actually come around, this is probably the biggest change in, in, of the sort of softening of what I said in my book, Americans more than eight years ago. I think the softening is more receptivity on my part toward temporary workers. And, um, and I think a lot of this, when you write something like this, is to kind of imagine um, 
there's this, this tension that I'm not totally resolved by the, uh, between what is the what is the ideal prescription in identifying a lot of the second bests along the way. So I think like, tepid workers is a, is a transitional second best. I think national borders is a good transitional second best. I, mean, I think having the doctors in the micro prescriptions not always is a transitional second best. But the reason it's set up this way uh, is of course is because I think we have to kind of think this way um, in balancing our ideals with what we really think is so we think is politically feasible and not just politically feasible, but also something that a wide group of people um, could find acceptable. So let me just stop there and then just sort of hope to see what, what you all have to say. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much to, uh, to, to uh, took my admonition to criticize very seriously. It really, I think, pointed us toward the core of the, the, the most difficult issue in the immigration debate, namely that of freedom versus community. At least that's how I, I heard it. So why don't we, if you hear me, why don't we go to Mexico for uh, the bullet for the first set of questions? Uh, are there questions? Here? No, no, we don't have we don't have questions in Colef. Ah, uh, okay, yes, we have we have one question. Yes, uh, we have some problems with audio, so it was not very yes. easy to understand. Okay, see, sí, bueno, can you hear me? Yes. Bueno, <coughs> okay, yeah. so so we established that the. Um, the labor market requirements demand workforce, right? And there are certain authors here in uh, Latin America that throw in the demographic change in the U.S. population. I mean, in the future, we're, we're seeing how the whole structure of the U.S. population is changing, and the whole economic system is going to keep demanding workforce. And a lot of that workforce is going to have to come from, uh, you know, through immigration. So <clears throat> my question will be, how sustainable, so if we're seeing in reality, demographic change and, and you know, economic driven immigration policy, how sustainable is a whole political discourse of anti-immigration, speci specifically from, you know, the conservative right? How sustainable is that on the long term? Okay. No, uh, that would be all. So why don't I collect two questions from the room and then we'll turn it over to the Okay. So let me collect two of the questions. Yes. Should we be appealing to the 14th Amendment until the states ratify it? That's one of the biggest scandals in America. Could you clarify what you mean by until we ratify it? Well, the 14th Amendment has never been ratified by the states, and that's perfectly well known, and it's a big uh, a scandal here in America. It has been for 150 years now. Okay, another question? <laughs> well, since nobody has a question, let me go. I don't know if you ever responded to uh, Ahilan's point about this question and the hope. Oh, yeah. um, because I wanted to hear that and, and also what you think about the state citizenship uh, bill in New York. Okay, so that, so that everyone can hear the question about the response to discretion and what the, 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 the New York state citizenship. And the New York state citizenship. So, I don't know whether someone wants to respond to the first question. Very well, probably the second. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll speak. Okay. So, to the question um, from Colin, uh, it's a great question about changing demographics, and the, uh, the question was about the sustainability of, of, of anti immigrant stances. So, I'll have a, a, a great long term answer for you. But it is interesting to think about how anti immigrant. Uh, political impulses have sustained themselves in the United States, right? And it, 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 you won't actually even have to look to the far future. Even if you look at contemporary politics, if you hold most people, things, for example, like the Dream Act, and Hiroshi points this out, in the book, have actually enjoyed 
fairly overwhelming support amongst the American voting public. So then the logical question is, if that's true, why hasn't the DREAM Act been passed, even though it's been proposed and brought up in, in, uh, in Congress several times over the past um, 12 years? So, that, you know, so it, we, and certainly as the, the demographics of the population change, um, maybe that the answer that I'm about to you know, sketch out or some, some thoughts I might give will change, right? But here's the thing, you know, as, as even if that's true nationally, the way in which Congress is comprised makes a significant difference. And one of the other things that you start to see, and you see this has been going on, but uh, maybe pronounced since 2001, is significant polarization of, uh, of, of uh, in, in, um, in, voting, in voting districts, uh, which allows for, um, especially in primary contexts, right, and, and let's say the Republican primaries in various states for congressional seat, uh, seats, uh, state gubernatorial seats, et cetera, to often be controlled by minorities. And so one of the things that you can see if you look empirically at the way in which these things have worked, there is essentially enough districts where you have pulled up votes such that even if you have something that enjoys significant popular support, such as the Dream Act, it's unlikely to get the votes that you need in the House to pass. And the starkest example, right, the S S744, the Senate um, the Bill on Comprehensive Immigration Reform that was passed uh, last year, or last summer, summer and a half, or one and a half years ago, uh, in the Senate, bipartisan, not, not so many Republicans, but certainly a bipartisan, bipartisan bill that passed, and a lot of people thought, okay, this is the moment where we're going to see comprehensive immigration reform. But if you're really looking at the politics of how the House members are elected and the, the contest, the primary contest, contest that led to their election, I think you would have had cause to be a lot more skeptical. I personally would have told you that there's zero chance that there's going to be comprehensive reform then and now. Um, and that's because they're in those pockets who have enough hold-up votes to ensure that at least for the near term, that you won't get the votes that you need uh, in the House. And so to the question, it very well might change, but it, the demographics as they currently stand are changing in the sense that you're getting the, the districts that are more pro-immigrant or integrative are becoming bigger and stronger, but they're not doing anything necessarily to change those districts that have been the holdup votes. And so that's one possible answer, but maybe you know that could change, or at least as, as you know, current politics suggests that. I'll just say quickly before I answer the question about the 14th Amendment that uh, he's not just saying that. I actually met Professor uh, Gosaker at a conference in uh, 2010, and it was the Senate bill that just passed. And uh, I was saying, So, what do you think is going to happen? And he said, I don't think there's any way it's going to pass. In <laughs> so, in fact, no one else, you know, or at least none of the circles that I would work with, people that would have found that quite surprising. But, um, so I know a little bit about the uh, 14th Amendment's uh, ratification because it's something that's come up uh, from time to time. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's true. The 14th Amendment was ratified. You know, it, was, it was ratified. There are pieces of paper in Washington, D.C. that every state's uh, you know, ratification documents that are there. Um, it's an idea that I think has persisted in part because the validity of some of the ratifications has been called into question by some people because they were done under coercion. Uh, which at some level, like obviously they were, because the Civil War was, was fought, and so you know, there was no <laughs> um, But I think um, you know, the, the argument for it is, I mean, as I said, you know, as a formal matter, it's ratified. There's actually, this is going to sound really odd, but I think there's actually a better argument that the Constitution uh, itself, the 1787, you know, is, is not, because it's, it's, it's not enacted under the rules of the Articles of Confederation. And there's actually a better argument for the Constitution's invalidity than there is for the 14th Amendment's invalidity. It's not to say that I think I don't but, but I think, I, I think there is a larger kind of idea though underneath there, right, which is at some level, and there's a, there's a defense of an idea of your book in a way, right? At some point, uh, accession by sort of practice and like common, common kind of belief and then some behavior, it kind of erases these things. You know, and, and every justice in the Supreme Court for a very long period of time has assumed uh, and acted on the validity of the 14th Amendment, including especially for right citizenship from time to time. Uh, and so now it's sort of accepted. 
And I think that's an interesting kind of point for some of the robot kind of claims that you that you make throughout here, right? The idea that that um, if, if we tolerate or accept it, that something at some point we we decide, you know, certain kinds of um, analytical objections to it, whether they're good or not. Uh, answer, try, answer, uh, try answer to answer trying to answer some question, questions about discretion and state citizenship. And I think the thing you expected to remind me about the discretion point. Um, it's true. One of the one of the um, one of the things I try to do in the book, and I don't know if I try to do this, if I do it successfully, but I really try to take seriously what the counter argument is and every given point. Like you know, if you were skeptical on this row, you would say this, and here's my response. Um, and I think I try at one point to acknowledge this tension between discussion. It's true that I think of discretion as as the bad thing, in the sense that we have selective enforcement, and the enforcement is driven by discretion. Um, but it's also true that I make an argument for. Um, for example, judge, judges being able to grant permanent residence on discretionary grounds. And here's the way I think about it. Um, and I actually think I, I say this at one point in the book, but maybe it's, it's very near and put that spend more time on it. I think of discretion really as um, the evil or the, 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 the troubling part of discretion is really kind of a, I suppose, what lawyers call a principal agent problem. That, that, um, you know, that the problem is you have the law, and the law is written a certain way, but we know that someone's going to exercise discretion. And if you delegate it to the people who cannot be controlled, then you maximize the opportunity to do things like engage in racial profile uh, and enforcement. So what troubles me about this question that is given to state and local police under Arizona SB 1070 is the opportunity to do things that are going to be hard to detect later and hard to remedy later. So that's why I think it's that it's that kind of discretion. The reason I think that immigration judge discretion does not fall into that category is another example or a different type of principal agent thing, which is that immigration judges do what they do with the court. Uh, immigration judges do what they do um, with mechanisms to judge um, the validity of what they do, and there's a certain transparency. And this is the reason why, like the not one said, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that federal authorities don't discriminate. I do think, though, that discrimination is far easier to control if you have smaller, if you have smaller group of actors. Um, with regard to state citizenship, that's really interesting, too, because I think that, um, so the New York has this bill um, that sort of purports to grant state citizenship. The reason we use the word report is because, you know, it's sort of it's, it's, it's that's what state citizenship really means. It's interesting that the uh, that in California, I New mean, York um, is actually now saying it's at the forefront, and it's going to be edited legislatively. But in California, there's something called the Little Hoover Commission, and the Little Hoover Commission um, proposed in a report about 15 years ago that there'd be something called the Golden State Residency Card, and it was articulated exactly in the terms of the New York State with the proposals of people had. I think what you're having, what you're seeing in this country, this like cycles back to the first question from Bonnet about the. I think what you're seeing is really um, many legalizations going on all over the place. You're seeing many legalizations with the 540 with the grant of rights in the workplace. And I think what you're seeing is a lot of pressure you know, from the states to, to, to basically what New York's trying to do is trying to break the impasse through local action. Um, but as, as Anyone said, I mean, my, my part of my book is a skepticism of um, enforcement discretion in state actors because of the potential for discrimination. And I don't see that in a case um, where you have the pressure going the other way. For the question from uh, Colette of one of the other um, uh, centers in Mexico? No. no? University. Uh, University of Southern California, Veronica, do you have questions? There. Yes, we had a question here. Uh, well, it was very difficult to to follow the um, the talk. However, I think um, we we got some of the main uh, points that they were discussed, and we would like to um, work. Let me start with uh, this uh, brief comment. So I just uh, finished teaching uh, the social construction of illegality, and we have been covering the different historical periods in the Mexican migration to the United States. And um, I think uh, 
you know, we have seen how American uh, migration policy has changed over the decades with respect to Mexican migration. And as you mentioned, uh, in terms of the 1965 migration law, marked a turning point in the way in which migration in general, but particularly with regards to Mexico, is um, unfolding. So in the last years, with this discussion, particularly from the point of view of sociology, that we are interested to see what is the impact in regards to the social relations. So this construction, I would like to hear you, um, your thoughts about all these different ways in which uh, migrants have been criminalized. You know, because before um, 1988, before 1965, I mean, they were not even considered um, illegal. You know, so what is the meaning of uh, of this criminalization, particularly in regards to families? I mean, you mentioned, like, uh, I think, uh, all of you talking about this deportation, this uh, crisis. I mean, we're talking about 2.2 million people they have in the port. So this vulnerability of uh, families, uh, transnational uh, migrant communities, and I would like to, so what, 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 my question in concrete is, what is the role of law in terms of protection of basic civil rights when we're talking about migrants? Thank you. That's a big and important question. Um, so we didn't really talk about the expanding intersection between criminal and immigration law. I mean, the book does touch upon that in a number of chapters, because I think it's very important. Different ways to look at this, uh, different parts to, uh, to the question that I think are really important. One is to mark 1965 as, a, as um, all of us have mentioned, I think, how it really cut off lawful avenues to come from Latin America by imposing numerical quotas, for example, for the first time. <laughs> At the same time, as temporary worker programs were tremendously restricted. So one of the things that's been interesting, with, particularly with regard to Mexico, is that it imposed a nominal equality on the world of immigration in this country. Because in 1965, the big political move was to end the system that discriminated greatly against Asia and Africa, and also against Southern and Eastern Europe. And so part of what's happened is that Mexico has suffered a lot from the formal equality of everyone being limited to a certain number of visas when in fact that entirely ignores economic and historical relationships. The second thing is that you've had a tremendous use of, uh, of criminal criminal law in this context. And I think that this is largely a, a, an example of sort of hyper-legalization. So in other words, you go from a system where the law, line doesn't matter as much as uh, as much as it does in the early part of the 20th century, it doesn't matter as much as it does in the later part of the 20th century. Um, I, you know, of course, in the book, I can't resist talking about Woody Guthrie and uh, his song, Deportee, Plain Right to Los Gatos. And one of the verses is some of us are legal and some are just not wanted. More contracts up and we have to move on. So, so I think what's happening in the criminal law is that if you're really going to say, we really are going to insist on line, we really insist on, on, insist on strong enforcement. It is also a very, um, it's a way of raising the decibel level and saying we really mean we're not supposed to be able to criminalize it. It's also an interesting uh, intervention in the federalism, in the, the role of states and localities, because I think that the turn to criminal law actually expands the role of states in, in, in the criminal enforcement um, context. Um, and, and, and so I think one of the costs of this, as, 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 as the question suggests, is, is that it, is the, is the, the insistence on the criminal, the, 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 the crime level um, has then even more than fire law ignored a lot of the social realities where, of course, you have families who with different immigration status. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I have one. Hold on, hold on. We're going to hold on one. Okay, so I have, I, I think, I think there's two comments, but maybe, maybe the questions will emerge as I jump it up. So the first is just to pick up on Andres' question here in the South of New York. Uh, I think, yeah. which, uh, 
I don't remember which one, but that would be great. The, the New York State citizenship uh, proposal, which is, is ironic when you go back to the moment at which Mexicans in the United States became American citizens, right? That 1850 moment when California and California and, uh, became a state, and so the Mexicans who lived in Texas and California, the Mexicans, you know, who became Mexican American, I, I call them the first Mexican Americans in my, in my own work. When they became um, they became state citizens at that moment and had significant political power, although it was later denied in various kinds of ways in terms of practice. But two thirds of those Mexicans from the northern Mexico were living in the New Mexico territory, which was there and New Mexico at that time, and they were denied state citizenship because we were talking about federal territory there. So it's very interesting to me that the move, the political move at that time was very explicitly to deny them the, the powerful citizenship, which would have been state citizenship at the time, and grant them the meaningless citizenship, which was federal citizenship at the time. Now we're in a very different mode, and I think it would be a great topic for you, Andres, or other students to write an article on exploring, I think, this, this Currently, uh, I think it's interesting. The other, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, the very first question um, I heard very differently than I think that, that you heard based on your response. And so the way that I, I, I don't know what the person meant, I hope I hope they'll chime in um, if there's time, but what I heard it to be a question about was not the demographic trends about Latinos becoming a very significant part of the voting block, but about fundamental demographics we have an aging population in the United States. There's a, a young population south of the border and increasingly you know, here. And we're going to continue to need labor. And that's not going to change. And I think one way to read the history, and, and I guess this is where there's a question you know, for you, to read the history of US um, immigration law is to see that it's always responsive to economic needs in this country. And so you could say that that was true in 1996. You can say that that's true now for the, some of the pressure that's lining up for if, if there is going to be any, any uh, meaningful reform for the, the worker, um, temporary worker provisions, et cetera. And I just wonder if we looked at it in that way, and we really, hit, I heard this question say, is it sustainable given the, the way the labor force is changing and the fact that we have an aging workforce that is going to continue for the foreseeable future? Um, for the, the century to come to need younger workers. Um, uh, it's not sustainable, right? So so we're gonna have, so, so is that the way to get some pressure? The, the pressure is probably not gonna come from the left. Uh, you know, we're not probably, those of us, I'll associate myself with the left on immigration policy. Our ideas are probably not gonna be made law. You know, that's sort of your political reality with the open borders argument. Um, but. The, those who have economic power and who need labor, they will be able to enact uh, immigration policy in their interest. Yeah, I mean, but there are other questions. I'm going to try to be real brief. But first of all, yeah, I mean, I, I really recommend, I mean, everyone, uh, Lord God his book, Manifest Destinies on this point, because I think this whole idea of state and federal citizens is really, really important. Um, and it is that idea. Um, the, the, uh, the, the inevitability of it and, and sustainability, I mean, I agree with you, it's not. And it's interesting to see, um, it's totally right that many of the coalitions that have to come together in Congress to enact uh, are going to involve a lot of basically the business community uh, and the Republican Party. And in, in some ways, it's the Republican Party uh, symbolized by George W. Bush and Jeb Bush, uh, which doesn't, but doesn't seem powerful enough to get over the hurdles. Um, and it's, and it's interesting to see how the same kinds of arguments you made and how it's played out in other societies that are even more aging as it were at this one, right? And you see this in Japan, you see this in Germany, for example. Um, and um, it's been interesting to see, um, you know, I've lived in Germany for long periods of time, at, in different decades, actually, over the last 30, 40 years. And, and it's been interesting to see sort of the, 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 the the demographically non-sustainability argument shifts over into kind of a, a cultural shift, which then shifts over into a political shift, which then starts to break down some of the things that we that, that people fought for in wild ball, like no more Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
somebody who would like to come to the U.S. but you know, might have difficulties going to college eventually. Um, I find it a fascinating to think about also Viola versus Doe in relation to the cost, the kind of utilitarian considerations that were not in the background of that decision that it would be a great cost to the country to have so much of the populace not be att have attended public school, to not be right. educated. Right. And, uh, and, and, and it's just a question of how far up you want to extend that argument. But what becomes interesting is when you extend it up to higher education, you know, do people born in this country also, you know, have, should have that opportunity to pursue higher education? Because the higher education itself has become a selective mechanism for many people um, to come here. Um, the university is influenced in deciding who is admitted. Um, has a some uh, great discretion who's going to get an honor and visa. So I guess the question is, is that how do you think conceptually about like higher education um, as we have more and more international students coming um, and people see a degree in the U.S. Uh, as a pathway to success, not just here but also in their own country. Um, how that kind of threshold of the eligibility of citizenship uh, being able to attain a college education here, for the both of the people who are here unlawfully uh, or undocumented, and the people that would like to come here um, and become citizens, how do you how do you think about that? Well, I mean, well, I'm there to address. I mean, it's true that there are people. It's there's the very the opportunities to get from this country based on your job and who you want to degree. That doesn't mean people with that degree stay out of this country. You have to just have a proper relationship, family relationships. Um, so a couple, I mean, it's somewhat different question, Jake, but, but let, me, let me just try to hit a couple things. Um, one is that the question of whether it's, this country should prefer people with PhDs, and in fact, the, the bill that passed the Senate, you know, would, would have given a green card in this kind of very obliquely drafted way to anyone with a PhD from anywhere in the world. Um, but I think it really raises this very fundamental question that we want to talk about, and that is the question of time. I mean, what's the time horizon? Because I think a lot of the immediate politics is why should we let people in here who don't have a college degree? Um, there's two, I think, responses to that. One is because those are the people that sometimes allow businesses to stay afloat in this country and then allow people, uh, all kinds of people, to have jobs. But the other, though, is that those people have children and those children win Nobel Prizes. Um, and, 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 and that sort of multi generational argument. Um, the other thing that's really in your question, and this is part of the book that honestly maybe the most utopian, but I, I feel it needs to be named, and that is that. Um, so much of the inequities that appear to come from immigration are really very much the failure of the American educational system. And the very notion that someone who comes to this country and is able to displace all kinds of people is such an indictment of the way we don't educate people, we don't invest in education. Uh, and, 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 and so, um, yeah, that's yet another example of immigration law is just a symptom of many deeper sorts of things. And I don't want to get too long with those you guys have to say. Other questions? Another question from Mexico? No. No? No, no not anymore. On the other side? Okay, anyone else? Yes. Uh, do you feel that uh, any shifts in, in technological advances are going to, you know, sort of tip the scale with uh, regards to, uh, what is it, uh, low training versus high training uh, uh, fields with regards to integration? Okay, so so this is a really interesting sort of thing because I think a lot of people who are in favor of strict enforcement 
would say that if we strictly enforced, let's say, immigration laws against farm workers, that California, the agribusiness, would shift its crop, and it would make only crops that could be mechanized. It would say that. So that's that's what we have to do, right? And so I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with the idea that that may be the way things are going as the world becomes um, more reliant on technology. That said, to me, the interesting question, or the interesting sort of thing that, that you're really raising is, is that which comes first? You see, I don't have a lot of faith that you can build a bigger wall, and then all of a sudden people will come, and then all of a sudden agriculture will develop. You know, UC Davis tell it, and then something that will, allow, that will not require that. I think that um, a much more sustainable long term is that you have economic development in countries so that people decide that they don't want to do the work either here, and that will force much more organically um, the mechanization to, to arise. That's, that's, and then there's certain things that we rely on immigrant labor for that don't seem to be mechanizable. Um, and I'm really struck that, that somebody, uh, um, that uh, so much of this involves child care and, and, and things of that nature. Questions? So then I will use the okay. privilege of being chair to ask one. So, uh, and I, I think, you know, to kind of bring this back to what uh, seems to me the, the, the core issue that was raised by both of you, right, that the, the book seems to be calling for open borders without actually doing so. And, you know, when you uh, responded to one of the questions about, uh, when you were talking about the 14th Amendment and citizenship, you, you made the case uh, in, that citizenship was, or access to citizenship was imperative for people, and now I'm quoting you, living in society. Okay. And, and I think, you know, what did you mean by living in society? What you meant was a bounded entity, a society that is contained within territorial boundaries. And I think that that's how we think about society. I mean, we can think about global society, right. but other than that, we're thinking about national society. And, 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 you know, if you think about, for example, the dreamers, uh, the claim is they're Americans, right? Americans in the heart, that's what, that's the, that's the basis for being, having an American passport. And so that, and so that, I mean, isn't this really the kind of nub of the kind of immigration dilemma? That, that there is this conflict between freedom and community, and there's no way out of it. And, and in that sense, it's a, you know, if there's no way out, then all that we can do is third or fourth best solutions. And and uh, and they're all going to be messy and unsatisfactory. We can do better than what we're doing now, but, you know, I, it seems to me that we just can't go as far as the, our two critics were suggesting. I don't know. Do you, you want to? Yeah, I want to hear that. Come on. I want to see if I can think I think one thing is, I was distinguishing between open borders and a world with no quotas. And I think those are two very, very different things. So it's not that you can't exclude people from the country. It's just that you can't exclude them merely on the ground that you're only allowed to have you know, whatever it is, X number of people from Mexico or El Salvador or whatever country it is to come into the United States. Right? And those are fundamentally different things. Because if we're going to have a job. Right, right, exactly. To have a job or to have, you know, I mean, you could structure it a lot of different ways, right? Um, but, um, and again, I should say, like, this is just to me about the, the argument that comes out as I read the book. You know, it seems to me like this is the justification that's really kind of driving a lot of what are, you know, in which, I, you know, it's, I don't know, that's like a psychoanalytic claim about her or something like that. But, 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 but oh, right, right. But, but then, so, you know, I think, you know, on the often had people defend borders, which I still think is a different thing from defending the world quotas, right? But leaving that aside, right? Um, people defend borders on the ground that, yes, this is how we think about society, but I'm not sure I, I necessarily agree with that. I think we think about society a lot of different ways in different contexts. You know, when we think about society in uh, the school and then in you know, Los Angeles and in California and in the West. And you know, so I'm, I'm not sure that um, why the particular salience of that grouping is so kind of central as opposed to you know, various other ways in which we think about it, especially in this historical context where we are living in part of the world that was, in fact, Mexican territory for a very long period of time, and where there was no 
there was no quota prior to 1965, so people could freely go back and forth. And as one of the, um, the um, questions earlier had said, where the, the idea that this were like a set of people whose legality could be regulated here on the basis of you know, their number did not exist. So, so I think sovereignty, you know, that's an old idea. You know, territory, that's an old idea. The idea that there should be a quota that limits to a particular amount of people coming from Latin America to the U.S. not an old idea, and I think it's fundamentally different. Um, and then I think that, you know the last thing. I mean, this is sort of I, um, Joseph Karens, who's a um, uh, somebody who I'm sure you, you know who that is, but he's a very interesting um, uh, legal and social philosopher who writes about uh, borders. And one of the things that he says, which many people have said, Frederick Douglass, all kinds of people, I mean, that an idea as old doesn't necessarily. You know, give it give it sort of normative force for that reason. You know, in and of itself, you know, slavery was also a very old idea. You know, lots, lots of ideas are old. It doesn't make them right. Um, and I think I think it is. I'm I'm still wearing my own personal hat on. You know, I'm still waiting to hear. And I say this. You know, my parents, uh, a lot of people from my uh, country, Sri Lanka, but also Ethiopian's country, you know, are refugees who fled a civil war that came there. You know, and I'm I'm still waiting to hear an argument for why the fact that you were born somewhere else. You know, means that you cannot go to some other country with your life at stake, or if you're going to live in permanent poverty for generations or something like that. And I'm still waiting to hear a strong normative defense of that of that view. Um, so anyway, yeah, those are those are some of my my thoughts about it. Um, sure. I, I just so I, I think partly I was trying to just be provocative by using the word open borders and and perhaps in our police. So so I, I do take the point. I think it's it's probably more right to say that we're a country is really perhaps talking about as well in which without quotas or at least the number is determined, perhaps not predetermined by some congressional legislation based on some abstract notion of how many people should be let in, but rather by what markets dictate and maybe family ties together, and that's inevitably gonna be a very large number, right? And so, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't think we need to necessarily, I guess, think of Hiroshi as depending on those, some of those ideas perhaps are uh, are shared between open borders and, and large quotas, but it's correct to say they're not the same. I tend to think of it more, and I think of question, the, the point that, that Ahilan came to at the end of his remarks, is that you're always making, I think, then bargains and compromises between uh, different types of equality, right? That you're, you might be enhancing equality within one sphere, but that necessarily may, means that you're making a bargain and you're diminishing, perhaps diminishing equality uh, in some other sphere. And so I, I guess the, the, the question really is which of those bargains are we willing to accept and for what reasons? And really my question to Hiroshi then would be more better put as, you know, why is it that you believe that this type of sacrifice is better than another type of sacrifice if we can see that every every line we draw is going to create some inequality somewhere. So it, it's, it's really true that, that, that to the extent I, I, my argument adds up to something um, in the open borders direction that it's really true that it doesn't go that far. It really suggests that it should not be um, limited numerically in advance. Um, I, think, I think it is an important distinction I, I know that, you, that you're making. Um, so this really gets from cycles back around to sort of, you know, in society and borders and things like that. And somehow I had the feeling that in a session it would come down to this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, you know, so just, just as an aside, putting this book together, I mean, it's, uh, I, you know, a bunch of you heard me say this, this book really has everything I thought about um, in it, like there's nothing left. Um, and, and, and the challenge of the book is, is people tell me, I think your book is really about this, it's really about that, it's really about, about all those things. And I think that the, the challenge has been really to try to put them in a mosaic where, you know, everything from A to Z is connected and here's how they're connected. And that's much more challenging than sitting in a position on the A, B, C, or F, or you or anything like that. So that's just kind of the thing about the writing of the book. Okay, but um, on, on borders, I mean, the, the, the book does have some pages that's, that would really strike you, um, some readers, and I've been you know, challenged quite a bit from, from the left, from my left, on this, which is really, it's a, it's a defense of national borders. But this gets back to the second, third best thing, because I'm really, I'm really, I'm really skeptical of, the, of, of a certain type of open borders world. And this is open borders, not the other I'm really skeptical of the open borders world where 
Um, I think you might have mentioned the, the ball service notion of this thousand petty forfeiture system. I'm really skeptical of open voters' world where people then feel forced to retreat into their gated communities of one kind or another, whether it's church or class or race or religion. Uh, religion uh, so I'm coming back to that. So it's it's so, so that's a different notion of second best. And so what troubles me about the borders that we have is not the border, the fact that they're borders, but that the borders are so inconsistent with with principles of equality that we could adhere to and still have borders. And one of those is to not apply those borders in a racially discriminatory way. So I think we moved from a system of 465 where it was explicitly racially discriminatory. I mean, you know, before the American Civil War, I mean, it was really you know, based on slavery. From then to 65, we get to the point of actual, like, explicit discrimination in citizenship and immigration law. Now we move to a regime where the discrimination, I think, occurs much more in the gap between the law and the action law and the books. And so what I'm trying to look for is a system where at least the borders are not discriminatory. Then we can talk about something beyond that. But that gets, cycles back to sort of working with the second best. And that's, that's really hard when you're trying to do a book that's about law. But it's really about policy, but then it's not just about law and policy, but it's also about law and two kinds of policy. One is realistic policy, and the other is the world that you wish it had been created. So, okay. so on that note, why don't we uh, end? Thank you so much for your Okay. Uh, thank you very much for letting us participate in this presentation. Are we on? Yes? Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you for letting us to participate in this presentation. And uh, we uh, are hoping to receive very soon the book here in Colef, in Tijuana. We are close to California, but sometimes we think that we are very far from California. <laughs> and more closer to the border. And uh, uh, so uh, we invite you to participate in next session. It will be the ninth session. And it will be, uh, the host will be CSAS Golfo uh, in Veracruz, uh, Mexico. Uh, we will be with Rodolfo Garcia Zamora. And uh, the title of the presentation will be The Impact and uh, uh, sorry, I will say in, t in Spanish, los impactos y desafíos del retorno de migrantes mexicanos de Estados Unidos hacia un programa de apoyo integral de los migrantes y sus familias. And uh, uh, thank you to all of you. <laughs>